All right, all right, all right. Say good evening to everybody. I know my regular phone may be a little blurry, so if it is, forgive us. But we got to keep on rolling with our with our lesson. Uh, we are continuing in our our topical study uh, and thematic study throughout the year of spiritual warfare. And presently, we are dealing with uh, our three enemies. Um, uh, we began the year uh, opening up in Ephesians chapter 6, 1st and 2nd uh, Corinthians, rather, chapter 10. Uh, and we'll bounce back and, and forth to those throughout uh, because all, uh, many of our other uh, scriptures, many of our other thoughts will always tie back into those things that were uh, given to us uh, regarding putting on the whole armor, regarding uh, uh, the weapons of our warfare, regarding uh, even Isaiah chapter uh, 54, that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. And in that same passage, uh, that was verse 17 and verse 16, uh, God tells that he is the one who, who formed, uh, 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 formed the destroyer. Uh, for his purposes. Uh, and so we have to recognize uh, who we are, whose we are at any given time. We also have also given some excerpts from a book called uh, Spiritual Warfare by uh, author uh, Max Anders and gave two points that stuck out to me in that book, uh, early on in that book that said that spiritual warfare will manifest itself uh, to us uh, in two means, uh, by temptations uh, that we deal with or by spiritual opposition. And so uh, you are uh, being tempted uh, from time to time throughout your life. And I always say that uh, once we get saved, uh, sometimes people say, well, uh, it just seems like I'm just tempted more. It seems like I'm tempted so much more now. And I say, well, no, you're not tempted any more now than you were before. You just recognize it because you have a, a heightened spiritual awareness. You have a heightened discernment, spiritual discernment that goes along with uh, your relationship uh, uh, to God, that spiritual relationship that is now uh, open, that is now more broad because you uh, have a connection with God, the Father. And so we come to... <clears throat> We come to uh, this issue tonight again with spiritual warfare because we definitely, definitely, definitely uh, uh, have have enemies. We're dealing with three enemies. We're going to have a word of prayer before we go much further. Uh, but there are three enemies that we have been discussing over the last few weeks, uh, one being uh, uh, carnality or ourselves, uh, the old man, as we call uh, as we call it. Uh, uh, then the world, and, and then Satan or, or the devil, uh, Diabolos, uh, uh, many different names for uh, for uh, even some the the Satan, the Satan, uh, the devil. Uh, but there are many different devils. Uh, but we look upon Satan as uh, the chief devil, uh, and uh, those uh, other fallen angels become become demons. Uh, as as regard to uh, their spiritual uh, their spiritual form, um, we definitely have challenges, uh, and some of those things we cannot understand, we cannot explain uh, with uh, in the natural. And that's why uh, the natural mind, uh, as we learn cannot receive the things of God. The natural mind cannot understand even some of the spiritual wrestlings that we that we deal with. Uh, man, all you got to do is, is look on the news and you will be on your knees uh, praying. You'll be on your knees uh, crying. You'll be on your knees uh, looking up uh, unto God, uh, who is the source of our strength, who is the source of our of, any understanding, the things we don't know, the things we don't understand. Uh, the apostle John tells us, I mean, James, uh, in James chapter one, verse five tells us that if we lack wisdom, uh, we lack understanding, 
uh, then uh, we are to ask God who gives, who will give to us liberally, withholding, uh, upbraiding nothing. In other words, God doesn't want us stumbling around in the dark. Uh, and so we need to understand these enemies that we that we wrestle with, these enemies that that uh, that come against us and that that attack us, or uh, or the enemies that we allow ourselves to be attacked by. Uh, let's uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will see how the Lord takes us on uh, on today. Um, most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We need you. We need you uh, intently and intensely that we come to you uh, intentionally um, and on purpose. But dear God, we need you intensely, dear God, because it just seems uh, that the enemy is turning up uh, the heat in the fiery furnace again as we think of the Hebrew boys, dear God, that how that fiery furnace was turned up seven times hotter than it had been uh, turned before the God that uh, in these latter days, dear Lord, it just seems like uh, we have lost our way. It seems to God that the church uh, has has fallen short of uh, of the purpose that is set uh, before us. So, dear God, give us strength, spiritual strength, to reclaim the mission, to reclaim uh, the uh, the the principal mission uh, that you have for us. Uh, and dear God, that is reconciling all things, all people, all nature, all things back unto yourself because you are the creator. You are the sovereign one. You are, dear God, the ancient one of days. And so dear God, help us. Help us turn to you. And dear God, whatever that means, we know that some, dear God, may turn more easily than others back to you, dear God, but we still see that it seems as though some are turning away from you. And so, dear God, we need you, dear God, to show yourself mighty before us, manifest yourself uh, before us, come to us in dreams and visions uh, again, dear God, that that your people will be drawn to you and drawn to your word and drawn to understanding and drawn to churches where we can grow in the fellowship and grow in the uh, wisdom of the spirit. Thank you, Lord. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray and we say amen. All right. So we are dealing with these three enemies in our spiritual warfare. And I say our spiritual warfare, you have your own personal battles. Never get me wrong. You have your personal battles. But uh, as a entity, as a organism, a lot of people call the church an organization. But uh, we've all learned who know uh, of Christ, who know of God, that the church is, is better defined as an organism. It is a living uh, organism. That we are that Jesus Christ, that the Spirit is alive and well. The the Word of God is the living Word of God, the Logos, the living Word of God. And so, when we come to know Christ, when we come to know God, we too are made alive. We are made alive. We we can uh, go back where we left off some last week in Ephesians chapter two. That uh, that very, the very first verses in Ephesians chapter two speak to that. That we. Uh, we're once dead in our sins. We were once dead uh, in our thinking, in our thoughts, in our ways. And some still are. And then we never need to forget that some are still wrestling uh, because they don't know who they are. They don't uh, know uh, uh, who they represent. They don't know uh, their spiritual nature. They, are, they have been relegated to following the urges of the flesh, the urges, the carnal urges of the of these bodies and these minds uh, that are influenced by Satan, that are influenced by by the world, that are influenced by our own uh, lustful desires. And so we will jump back to Ephesians chapter two, because uh, we need the spirit to bring us to life. We need the spirit of God to uh, revive us. Uh, there's so much, so much, so much, so much going on. My, my prayers go out. Uh, to the Donaldson family. My prayers go out uh, 
uh, to so many right now. Uh, another friend uh, that is still dealing with uh, uh, death in their family, uh, Brother uh, Jack Hall and, uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, still praying for uh, Pastor uh, Jocelyn, William Jocelyn, still praying for Pastor uh, Jimmy Greer, still praying uh, for those who have lost uh, uh, loved ones, still praying for Pastor Derek Moore, still praying uh, so many. I could, I could go on and on and on uh, and still not be finished uh, uh, because those names will be coming to me uh, as I'm uh, throughout the day. Uh, but we definitely need to keep the line of prayer open. I, uh, sing that old song. Uh, when I went to go visit one of our church members who is bedridden now, uh, I began singing some of the uh, some of the older songs. Jesus on the main line, and uh, I will trust uh, in the Lord. Uh, and a lot of the younger people don't don't know the meaning or they can't feel, they can't understand the meaning of those songs. But those songs uh, have a visceral effect uh, in the lives of those who who came up in the church, even whether we veered off uh, from God, veered off from right, veered off from the thing. But when we hear those songs, something in us connects uh, to it. And uh, this one brother who began to sing that song and we could see, see tears come to his eye. He can't speak. Uh, to me, but I could see the emotion almost where he wants to sing with me, but cannot uh, bring bring the words. And so we are challenged uh, every day uh, with the flesh. We're challenged uh, with with the world. We're challenged uh, by by Satan. And so let's let's go to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. If you have your Bible, turn me to Ephesians chapter two. We're going to make our way into the second. Uh, the second uh, enemy, the world, uh, uh, again tonight. But uh, I want to start back here because uh, we're still dealing with uh, some dead things uh, within us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, General Electric Power Company, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, uh, and uh, Colossians. So Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you hath has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins? Uh, that's what I opened up talking about dead. So many of us have been dead in our sins. Uh, but uh, Paul here says to the believers uh, at Ephesus that uh, they have been quickened. You have he quickened. God, the father, uh, has quickened you or made you alive. Uh when we've been made alive in Christ and we've been made alive in God, uh, there's uh, there's the power to disconnect from old ways of operating, old ways of thinking, old ways of acting. Uh, there's power to do it. But the challenge is we have to make the choice to access the power. Uh, Paul makes this clear uh, even further in Ephesians uh, uh, chapter chapter three and verse twenty, uh, where uh, he says uh, there. Uh, uh, I mean Ephesians uh, chapter uh, four and verse twenty. I believe I may have gave you the right one. I'm in the wrong book, uh, but where he says uh, in essence that uh, we are able to do. It. God is able to do exceeding. Excuse me, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask. Or think uh, according to the power that works within us. I gave you the right verse. And so uh, 320. Now unto him who's able to keep us uh, to do exceeding rather abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. So we have the power within us. When we come to know God, when we come to know Christ and Christ uh, comes to dwell, the spirit of God comes to dwell within us. We have access to the power. We just don't always access the power. Uh, and we allow carnal thinking because once we know the Lord we're not uh, we're no longer in the natural state 
the natural state can cannot hear from God, cannot receive from God, cannot understand godly things, as we learn in First Corinthians chapter two. But uh, but here, once we come to know God, we have the authority, we have the ability, we have the power to uh, access the, the the power of God uh, that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter three, verse twenty uh, and twenty one. But uh, we can. Uh, continue in carnal thinking. Carnal thinking, uh, we talk about the three natures of man, the natural man, the carnal man, the spiritual man. The carnal man can hear from God, but oftentimes it listens to the flesh uh, and it leans to the flesh rather than leans to leaning to the spiritual things that God gives to us. So what does that mean? That means, uh, you know, there's been teachings of can a, a person who knows the Lord be uh, possessed by demonic forces. Some would say no, but some, and we look at times now, uh, if we if they're walking in carnality, they continue to walk in carnality and being influenced by those carnal thinkings, uh, some would believe that it is possible that, that, uh, that they're yielding over to their carnality. And in that carnality, they are giving the devil place, just like uh, Paul speaks of even in his book, Ephesians chapter four, verse 26, uh, when he's talking about anger, be angry and sin not, uh, and let not the sun go down on thy wrath. Uh, and give the devil no place. That when we give the devil place, the devil has access. That even with, you know, otherwise, otherwise he has to uh, ask for permission, uh, as he did with Job. That Job was a was a righteous man who eschewed evil and all those different things. And so uh, he was going about. He told God he was going about through the earth, walking up and down in it, looking uh, looking for whom he could disturb and destroy and all those different things. God said, have you considered my servant Job? And so he, uh, God gave him, Job gave uh, Satan Job's uh, address and, and told him where he was. Have you considered him? Uh, in other words, he allowed uh, Satan to touch him physically. He allowed Satan to touch his, uh, uh, touch his experience, touch his life. Uh, but the but the principle that I want us to understand is that uh, Satan can get access to a believer. Satan can get access to uh, a a man or woman of God, and so we have to be uh, mindful, not just always what we believe or what we think, what we've been taught, but what God shows us as a reality throughout throughout his word. And so we look here back in Ephesians chapter chapter two, uh, again, uh, verse, uh, I started at verse one, and he and you has he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh or our evil cravings, that uh, the lust of our flesh are those things that we crave, that we, uh, and when we have a craving, the craving is because they are things that we have experienced. They are things that we have uh, allowed either our eye gate, our ear gate, or, or by these five senses, touch, feel, taste, all those things that we have experienced because you don't crave something you never had before. You're curious about something that you've never experienced. You're curious about uh, things that you never uh, tasted. You're curious, you're curious about things that you that you never touched. But once you have experienced them, then there may be a craving for it because something in you liked how that felt. Something in you liked how that sounded. Something in you liked how that tasted. And so the, the principle uh, here that we need to uh, understand is that there were things that we used to do that if we're not careful, those things uh, can draw us back in can draw us backwards rather than, than forward. Now, does it mean that I can lose my salvation if I love the Lord, if I know the Lord, if I've accepted the Lord? If I have truly accepted the Lord, it does not necessarily mean that I, ha I, that I have lost. I cannot lose my salvation because I, I did not win 
my salvation. So my salvation was a gift to me. Your salvation uh, was or is and will be a gift to you uh, that, that you have eternal life given to you uh, by the merits of Jesus Christ, by the merits of the finished work of Christ, not by your merits. But I can grieve the Holy Spirit. I can uh, negate uh, reward. I can uh, negate uh, blessings. I can negate these things uh, that, that God has prepared for me. That, as the scripture tells us, the eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has entered into the heart what, uh, what God has prepared for those that love him. And so when we see here, Paul teaching uh, in second in Ephesians chapter two, uh, it says, but God who is rich in mercy in verse uh, verse four, but God who is who is rich in mercy. Who is rich in mercy uh, uh, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. So you were not, you didn't say, you couldn't say, well, when I get myself together, I'm going to get saved. No, because here, uh, and also in Romans chapter uh, five, verse eight, uh, it alludes to the fact that we were dead in our sin. You were dead in your sins uh, when uh, God quickened you, when he made you alive again, when he uh, saved you. We call it uh, being born again. When he calls you to be born again, you were born of the spirit and you were born of the blood. You were born of the water, not just born of the water, but you were born of the water, the blood and the spirit that you become a new spiritual being. According to second Corinthians chapter five and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, uh, behold, he is a new creature. Behold, old things be, uh, are old and our old things, all things, all things rather become new. And so when we, when we recognize that, when we recognize that uh, Paul emphasizes that it's by grace you are saved, by grace you are saved and raised up and raised us up together and made us sit together where? In heavenly places. That he made us sit in heavenly places. The old uh, old Cleopas Robinson song, "Save a seat for me." I don't have to beg somebody to save a seat for me. That when I come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I've been made to sit together with with Christ and others who who are believers in heavenly places. In other words, the place is already reserved for me in Christ Jesus. But I've got to be in Christ Jesus. I can't save myself. I can't just say, well, uh, well, I'm saved uh, because I was born uh, to a mother and a father who believed in God. I can't just say that I'm saved because uh, I, I can trace my genealogy back to Abraham. I can't just say that I'm saved uh, for any of those external reasons. It has to be that I have yielded my will to the will of God yielded my will to the will of the Father, to the will of the Son, to the will of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the triune God, uh, and made us uh, the one who made us to sit in, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It refers to the way he did it. He did it in Christ Jesus through the cross, by way of the cross, that in ages to come, Listen to this, that in age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And these are the verses that we know so well in verse eight and nine. Uh, and I like to go to 10 for by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is the, uh, the goodness of God. Grace is the goodness of God. Some say it's uh, God's riches uh, at Christ's expense. Uh, I say it's God's refuge uh, against a cursed existence. And so when we looked at this, it said that you, uh, uh, you are saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in Christ with, uh, with the cross ever uh, as, uh, as the icon of what Christ did. That Christ went to Calvary's cross, the worst form of execution uh, uh, to, known to man at the time to be hung out on stakes, 
uh, where the birds can come and pick away at your skin, naked uh, before everyone, humiliated, uh, beaten before you got uh, nailed to that cross where your blood is being drained from you and you're being weakened moment by moment and your breath is being taken. Uh, and then they come along to expedite the death by breaking uh, the bones of your leg or breaking uh, bones or stabbing you with the spear. All these different things. We recognize uh, what Christ did for us. Uh, how did, preacher, how does that help me today? Uh, it, it should in some way. And I know that there's so much controversy over uh, over. Uh, different religious beliefs. There's so much controversy. So we have to recognize that when Christian uh, teachers are teaching, we are teaching uh, from a biblical worldview, should be teaching from a biblical worldview, not just from a, a biblical denominational view, but a biblical worldview that whatever is taught from this, from this word can be broad enough or is broad enough for the entire world to glean from. Why? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If we believe in him, then we need to, uh, we need to trust him because uh, it is by his grace that we were raised. For by grace uh, are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. You did not do it yourself. It is a gift. It is the gift of God. Uh, and when we see the word gift used, God is speaking of his son uh, and the substitutionary work that Christ did for us uh, on the cross. Uh, and that is the way it was made possible for you and for me and for anybody and for anybody. And we see all these things now that people, uh, you know, there's an uptick in in mental health issues, there's an uptick in poverty. There's an uptick in uh, in many of the areas that we wrestle with in the natural realm. Uh, why? Because so often, also often, we have neglected uh, we have neglected these uh, avenues of spiritual growth. We have neglected the disciplines of of reading the word. We have neglected the disciplines of teaching uh, the word to our children and teaching uh, it to them. And I, I want you to understand, it's not just teaching the written word, the black and letter, the black and white letters on the page. Anybody can memorize that. It is a matter of getting the spirit of the word into our hearts and minds. It's a matter of getting the essence of what the words on the black and white page teach us or show us into practical living, into practice, pragmatic action of the word, not just hearing the word. That's how faith faith grows. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But faith is a substance of things hopeful and the evidence of things not seen. So when I hear the word, I must continue to hear the word and then I must begin to act. Faith calls for me to act on something. James, again, the apostle James said, faith without works is dead. James chapter two, uh, verse 14, faith without works is dead. So when we realize that, uh, that yes, I can hear the word. Yes, I can memorize the scripture. Yes, I can uh, be in church. But it doesn't mean that I am actively seeking a relationship with Christ. It doesn't mean I'm, active, I'm actively seeking a relationship with God that, that shows me and teaches me how to live uh, in this world, that shows me how to overcome. I was listening to um, a song. Uh, uh, this afternoon, I was coming from Murfreesboro back to Nashville, and uh, I, I could recognize the voice of Dorinda Clark Cole. And in this song, she has some commentary. I don't even know the name of the song, but I could hear the commentary where she said that God had to tell her, uh, stop telling people that you are a victim or, or stop telling people that you are a survivor. Stop telling people you're a survivor. You're not a survivor. You are a conqueror. 
And when we talk about spiritual warfare, we got to realize that, yes, there are things that we have survived, but we survived because we survived. We have to recognize that we became conquerors, that we conquered that thing because we survived. It didn't take us out. It didn't kill us. It touched us. Uh, all that Job went through, we talked about Job. It touched his physical body. It touched his family. It killed. It took, it took his family members away from him. It took his children, his sons and his daughters away. It took his cattle and things that would bring him riches. But uh, and even he was tempted with his own very self uh, he, to the point where he said, you know, curse the day that I was born. But uh, there he had to come back to a reality to trust God. Uh, he said, naked I came into this world, naked shall I uh, shall I return? I heard someone teaching say, yeah, that, that's so true. We came into this world naked. And the only reason we have clothes on when we die is somebody dressed us. We didn't dress ourselves. Uh, if we did, we dressed in that morning. But uh, we could just as well go into that dirt the way we came into this world. Uh, because uh, we have to recognize uh, that we have, we are bound by time and we only have a specific amount of time. We don't know what it is, but the time that we're here every day is a gift of God that we can turn our will over to his will. We can turn the keys over to, uh, to being owners uh, of these, of these bodies, these flesh bodies, this flesh mind, all those things to uh, giving it over to him and allowing him to be the landlord. Uh, of these bodies, allow him to understand that God, this is not, this is your house. This body is your house. This body belongs to you. This mind belongs to you. This mouth belongs to you. These hands and feet belong to you. Uh, that is yielding our members unto righteousness and not unto unrighteousness. And so when we come to that, we, we come to a place where God can use us. Uh, let's finish this in Ephesians. Then we're going to move on to, um, uh, to do, 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 do. we'll move on to uh, the topic of the world, I believe. Um, it says, and raised us up, I, I'm going I'm to back too far, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. You have no reason to be boasting uh, of, of, of how you saved yourself because you didn't save yourself. Uh, what you need to do is give your life to the Lord and remain humble. Walk in humility. Allow the humility of God to be with you. Uh, blessed are, uh, are, are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek in the spirit. Blessed are, uh, when, we, when we come to a point where, where we don't have to be uh, the top dog all the time. We don't have to be uh, on the top of the pile. That we can recognize that we can be a support for other people. We can be a support system for other people because that's what we're called to. That's what service is. That's what ministry is. Ministry is about serving other people, fulfilling the needs of other people, whether they be spiritual, whether they be physical or natural needs that people have. That is ministry. Jesus fed uh, multitudes, but he also uh, he fed them food, natural food. But he there was always a spiritual purpose tied to it. And we need to recognize that, that uh, even while Jesus was doing these spiritual things, he was still under spiritual attack. Uh, when when Jesus fed all those uh, 5,000, you go and you read Luke chapter 9, you, he fed the multitude there. And then uh, later on in the chapter, he took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration where, where he went uh, away a little bit and those rascals fell asleep. Uh, and when Peter woke up and came and he saw uh, Jesus there with the, with the, uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, I would say, oh, man, it is good for us to be here. If I was Jesus, I probably said, for real? That's why I brought you here. But you were over there asleep. Uh, so the problem is sometimes we are asleep. Uh, at the wheel, and we don't recognize the spiritual things that God is showing us on a daily basis. And that's why I talk about that our faith must become practical. It must become pragmatic. How I act every day should be governed by what I believe uh, in my faith system that, that causes me to be a, a man of integrity or a woman of integrity or a person of integrity. Uh, it is because I trust the word of God. I trust the will of God. 
And so uh, not my own works, as, as Paul just says, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. God crafted us. He crafted you just like he told uh, Jeremiah and said, I formed you in your mother's womb. And before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew what I was forming you for. I'm, I was forming you that you would be a prophet to the nations, not one nation, but to the nations. I formed you with a purpose. God made you with a purpose. God made me with a purpose. Uh, and the, the battle is. Uh, coming to know that purpose, seeking that purpose out, seeking out the plan of God, because his plan is greater. The, the same Jeremiah gave us a very popular verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I have to you. I know the plans, depending upon what version you use, that I have to you. Thoughts of good, thoughts of, uh, of hell, thoughts to bring you to an expected end, not to harm you, but to bring you to an expected end. So when we recognize that, that God had a plan for us before he made us and he created us and that we are his workmanship. And Psalm 139 uh, lets us know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God made us uh, with thoughtfulness and he had a plan in mind. Uh, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And that means that when we're born again, we are created as new create new creations new creatures in Christ Jesus, unto good works. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved to do good works. We are made new that we can fulfill the plan of God in the earth. And that plan is to win people or point people to Christ because the spirit of God that does the true winning. But we are to point people. We use the gift that God gives us, the gift of proclamation, the gift of teaching, the gift of helps, the gift of uh, uh, of, of healing, the gift, all these spiritual gifts. You can find lists of the spiritual gifts uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, you can uh, in, in Mark uh, the chapter 16, you, you begin to look for these things that, that God gave us, that he gave us the tools to help people see God. Not everybody's going to see God because uh, some people are blinded, uh, but some people are blinded with a purpose. Uh, you go read John chapter 9. All these things are coming to my head while I'm talking to you. You go read John chapter nine about the man who was born blind and the disciples began to ask Jesus, well, Jesus, why was this man born blind? What did his mother do? What did his father do? Who sinned that this that this man was born blind? And Jesus said, no one sinned. In essence, he said, no one sinned. I'm paraphrasing. He said, this was, uh, this was so that the works of God would be manifest in him. That in, us, in essence, this man was blind so that this moment would come to pass so that I will uh, open the eyes of this blind man and he's going to go tell the story of how he was blind, but now he can see. And people tried to turn the man against Jesus Christ. And look, you know, if I'm blind and a man touch me and uh, I, then I can see uh, you can say whatever you want. But you're not going to turn me against the Lord who opened up my eyes. And that should work spiritually as well. When our eyes are open spiritually, like those uh, disciples that were on the Emmaus Road, they were walking with Jesus, could not see Jesus, could not see him for who he was. They saw a physical man walking with them. They heard a physical man's voice walking with them. But until he sat down and meet with them and broke bread with them and gave them to eat while they were sitting there at, at meat, as it's called, eating the uh, communion bread, then their eyes were open and they recognized who was with them. They recognized Christ for who he was. Uh, the same, the very same thing uh, needs to happen to many of us. Many of us are going to church. Many of us ha have been singing in the choir. Many of us have been ushering at the door. Many of us have been deacons or preachers and all those different things, but we need a reboot. We need God to open our eyes so that we can see who he is in this generation. Uh, you know, this generation is is going to take is going to be a little bit different to reach 
We got the same word of God. The same spirit is at work. But we have to ask God, God, how can we reach them? How can we reach our young people who have have been lost to drugs, who have been lost because it's, it's acceptable. It's socially acceptable to 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 smoke what I want to smoke, to snuff what I want to snuff, to drink what I want to drink. And everybody's OK with it. But God, help me understand what it means to be a temple of the living God. What does that mean? That means that I've got to fight daily for my mind. I've got to fight daily for my heart. I've got to guard my heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. I've got to fight for my mind. I got to let this mind be in me that was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter two and verse five. And that, uh, that verse I just gave you about guarding your heart. Uh, uh, Proverbs chapter four, verse 23. We, we need we need to recognize that uh, there, that this is a battleground. Uh, that we're dealing with, uh, that uh, we we are challenged uh, daily. Uh, let's finish this this verse up. It said, "Which God, those uh, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, with which God has before ordained that we should walk in them." God ordained that we should walk in good works. God's purpose and plan is that we fulfill good works in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are challenges before us daily. Now, uh, we, we've talked about uh, challenges of the flesh. Uh, I still want to mention Galatians 5, uh, verse 16, uh, as, as we prepare to talk about, as we prepare to talk about the world uh but in Galatians chapter 5 I, I want to show you just a, a little bit of a difference uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 uh, it says this I say then walk in the spirit we read this verse but I'm gonna read it again this I say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh if I walk in the spirit, if I allow the spirit to lead me, then I will not take the path that the flesh wants to take me down. Uh, I will, it will, sometimes it's a fight. Sometimes you're sitting there saying, well, I know I shouldn't do this. I know I shouldn't say this. I know I shouldn't uh, drink this. I know I shouldn't smoke this. I know I shouldn't do this. Uh, but uh, you're weak in your flesh and you're weak in your spiritual nature because you're not feeding the spirit. We got to feed the spirit. We have to uh, feed the spirit just like you feed your flesh body. Just like you get up in the morning, you want some breakfast or you want some bacon and eggs or you want some uh, sausages and eggs or you want some uh, steak and eggs or whatever it is you want. Uh, and you're hungry. You go through the day and your body gets hungry. Your spirit gets hungry. That's why Jesus could tell them in the spirit and in, uh, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter five, where he says, "Look, uh, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. That if I hunger and thirst for righteousness, he says, why I'm going to be filled. You're going to be filled. We're going to be filled. If I'm hungry and if I'm thirsty for righteousness, God will fill me uh, to to overflowing. But I I got to trust Him. You got to trust Him." I said, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye would do, that you would do. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not, you are not under the law. If I'm walking in the spirit, I'm not under the law. What does that, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, if I'm if I'm walking in the spirit, uh, I'm not under the law. What does that mean? That means that uh, those things do not have dominion over me. The things that used to have dominion over me, they no longer have dominion over me. Uh, and they are under grace that I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. Does that mean that I'm lawless, that I can live lawlessly? No. It just means that now I'm on a different path, that I, I'm a saint who sometimes sin rather than a sinner who uh, doesn't care about being a saint. 
that now I care about the things of God. I care about righteousness. I care about uh, trusting God. I was talking to uh, someone today and they uh, uh, before I was leaving uh, from the place of business today, there was a new guy working uh, at the place and uh, they were telling him that I was a preacher and, and this and that. And they know I don't usually tell people until uh, they figure some things out for themselves as we talk or whatever. But they were telling him I was a pastor of a church here. And so I was asking, I said, are you a man of faith? And he said, uh, uh, oh, yeah. And I was like, man, you didn't sound very confident uh, in that. He said, oh, yeah. And he said, waiting for me. He said, yeah, I believe in a higher power. I said, oh, a higher power. See, any of us can believe in a, in a higher power. But see, God wants us to be specific with what I believe, with who I believe in, with who I'm trusting in. I, I don't want to just trust in uh, in something up there. I want to trust in the somebody that I know uh, up there. And so I tell said, we'll have some further discussion, I'm sure. And so uh, uh, we have to recognize that sometimes God puts us in circles in order to uh, either be an influence or be influenced. Um uh, back to this passage, but if you're led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works, I want you to hear this, that, uh, someone said that when I'm in Christ, uh, I, I, the scripture I just read in Ephesians chapter, uh, two verse 10, that I was made unto good works that I, I'm made for good works that some people, can do good deeds. A lot of people can do good deeds, but they can't do good works. Uh, and they said that now these are works of the flesh. Those people who don't know the Lord, they can do works of the flesh. They can do works of the flesh, but they can't do the works of the Lord. Why? Because they don't know the Lord. They are because those things are spiritually discerned. I can do works of the flesh if I'm in the flesh. And these things are works of the flesh. They are manifest, which are these adulteries, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, can't help it. Uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like. These are works of the flesh. That I, I yield, I have yielded my members to the works of the flesh. That means I'm not uh, in Christ. I'm not walking in the spirit of God. I'm not walking in that spirit. I'm not living in that spirit. See, I can be all around the spirit of Christ. I can be around people who know the Lord. I can be around people who, who have received Christ, who, who understand who they are and who are living and walking in the spirit. And I can be in the same house with them but not have understanding of who I am in Christ. Uh, why? Because it is, it's, it's discerned spiritually. And until the spirit uh, reaches me and the spirit is speaking to us, but the flesh, uh, the flesh ears do not want to hear uh, from the spirit of God uh, because then we hear people say it this way. Well, man, I would come to church. Or, well, you know, that, that church is always talking about stuff you can't do. We're, uh, we're always uh, looking for the negative. And even with this, this thing about tithing now, people who never believed any word Creflo Dollar ever said before he said what he just recently said about tithing. Now they're saying, oh, he repented. And now he was lying about tithing and all this and that. Uh, but uh, so they don't really recognize they never heard the teachings uh, that were taught before. They never heard some of the teachings. So the thing is, uh, we are under attack. The church is under attack, even from the inside, uh, just like Nehemiah was attacked from the outside and from the inside, from his own people and from exterior people, from people outside of uh, outside of Jerusalem, outside of the uh, the Hebrew people. Uh, we are under attack. And if we're not careful, we throw our hands up and surrender to the world and, to, and surrender to worldliness rather than throwing our hands up and surrender to God, who has the power to cause us to be conquerors over uh, the things that we deal with, over the things that we fight with. So uh, now we're going to shift gears and we're going to uh, talk about the world. We're going to talk about the things of the world. First John chapter two. First John chapter two. You have your Bible. Flip with me to first John chapter two. 
And we're going to begin in verse uh, 15. And that's, that verse says, uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The world spoken of here by John uh, deals with uh, the system that Satan, who we will talk about, is the, is the prince of the power of the air uh, to this world system. He is the ruler of this world system. And so when John is speaking here, the apostle John is speaking about loving not the world. He's saying, don't love the things that Satan has rule over. Don't love the things that Satan is directing and that Satan uh, is orchestrating uh, in this world. Uh, and you know, how can God say, uh, don't love the world and then tell us in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's two different contexts that we're seeing here. That in this first context, he's saying that God loves the world, the creation he made, but God doesn't love worldliness. Since the fall of man, since Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden and humanity from that point has been in a fallen state, the world is in a fallen state. God does not love the worldliness in the world. That's why even during the Old Testament time, God tired of, uh, of, of human folly. He to the point where he would, dest would destroy the earth in the day of Noah, to the point where he would have destroyed uh, the children of Israel out there in the wilderness, save Moses uh, standing in the gap, to the point that God called them stiff necked and rebellious people. Uh, and God knows the frame. God has a plan all along. He knew what would occur, but still, yet and still, uh, he loves his creation, but he does not love what his creation became. He does not love what his creation uh, resides in, what people have become comfortable with and what people have uh, coalesced to. In other words, that people uh, we have become numb to unrighteousness. We've become numb to sin. We've become numb to those things that are abominations to God. And so he says, love not the world or worldliness, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. If I love this world system more than I love God, then he says that the love of the father is not in me. The love of the creator is not in me. Uh, now, how do, how do I coincide uh, loving out the world with loving people? There, there's, there's a difference. There's a difference here that we have to recognize. God is talking about a world system. If I love this world system that is directed by Satan, that is directed by unrighteousness, that is given over to unrighteousness, then I don't love God. Uh, if I can just accept everything that is wrong and say, oh, well, that's just the way it is. No, that's not just the way it is. Maybe the way it is, but it's not the way it was designed to be that uh, I need to. Uh, there's two ways of thinking that I want to bring forward. I don't know if I bring it forth in this or bring it forth in a sermon. But uh, when we think about uh, how we live, we can either live. Uh, uh, under uh, the ideology of the first Adam, or we can live under the ideology of the second Adam. The first Adam, uh, God set everything in order the way things should be until they disobeyed him. And from that disobedience comes the fall and a fall, a great and calamitous fall. It was because uh, the world is still declining. The world is still falling. The world is still fading away. The, la the love of many has waxed cold that Jesus speaks of in Matthew chapter 24, that in the latter days, the love of many shall wax cold. In other words, there's not going to be a love for, uh, for humanity anymore. There's not going to be a sense of morality anymore. There's not going to be a respect for life anymore. There's not going to be uh, any of these things that we see. And so we see these issues arising and seeming to grow right before our very eyes. Um, and so, or we can live under uh, the ideology of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, 
uh, is known to be the second Adam, but the first born among many uh, that would be born in that would be reborn spiritually. Under this ideology, it is now we're, we're either living uh, in the, the, the life of the old Adam or we're living in the resurrection. We're either going to live in the resurrection. Uh, so I should be living a resurrected life. That means that now I uh, do the things that God leads me to do by way of the spirit. That, yes, this flesh has desires, this flesh has cravings, this flesh has this or that. But now I have the word of God and I understand that that my life choices need be filtered through the word and then discerned in the spirit. Filtered in the word, discerned in the spirit. Filtered in the word or discerned by the spirit. That when Because anybody can read the word. Anybody can read the black and white text, the black letters on the white page, but not everybody understands it because it must be spiritually discerned, must be spiritually discerned. That's something that you need to recognize. So love not the world, neither things of the world that are uh, that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Listen to this. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Oh, man, I see that thing. I got to have it. I see that thing. Uh, I'm attracted to this thing. Uh, I'm attracted. Not not even just thing. I'm attracted to this person. I know this person no good for me, but I, I'm drawn to this person. And so I, I follow the lust of the flesh or and the lust of the eyes, uh, the craving uh, of what I see. Uh, I, I see it, so I have to have it. I, I see it, so I see it, I like it, and I don't care what it costs, I'm going to get it. Uh, and the pride of life, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride has taken a many people down. Pride, the scripture tells us, goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction, and we need to recognize uh, that uh, I believe it's Proverbs 14 and verse 12 that says there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but that way leads to destruction. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but that way leads to destruction or leads to death. We need to recognize that pride will take us down the road that we shouldn't be going down. Uh, and then we'll realize that it's a dead end road. Uh, it's a dead end road when we listen to the things of the flesh rather than the things of God. Um, and so uh, it says the world passes away. Uh, I want to go back. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. This world system, not of our uh, heavenly father. Uh, and the world passes away, verse 17, and the lust thereof, everything that you could lust after, everything that you could want, everything you could desire, it is going back to the dirt. It's going to be, uh, it's going to find its fate. It's going to fade away. Uh, but he who does the will of God, listen to this, who does the will of God abides forever. When you choose in your heart to do the will of God, uh, you will abide forever. Your works, uh, the scripture of Revelation teaches us, your, uh, a man's works shall follow him. Uh, and so when I die or when you die, your physical body goes in the ground, but you're leaving something behind. You're leaving your personal legacy, the thoughts that people have of you, the remembrance of uh, uh, that people have of you. They either remember you to be a good person uh, uh, overall, and even the people who are lying say you were good, but 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 in circles they they may be saying, well, he was kind of low down, or she was this or that. She was. Uh, 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 a backbiter. <laughs> she was this or that. And so even those people who would try to uh, say the right thing or say good things, people know what type of person you really are. Uh, people know what remembrance they have of you, good, bad, or otherwise. And so uh, we see that 
we got to recognize that uh, you are leaving a testimony behind you. You're going to leave a testimony behind you. Um, uh, I believe it's uh, Hebrews chapter nine uh, that speaks uh, uh, to the fact that uh, for a testament to have uh, any weight, for a testament to be of importance, uh, first must come the death of the testator. Uh, and, this, and it's talking about a will, uh, the legal matter of a will. For someone to write a will, uh, that will has no weight until the person who wrote it dies. And then their wishes uh, or their will or their desires are now being proclaimed uh, for those who are left behind. Uh, and so uh, that's we talk about leaving a legacy. When I when I speak of doing something good, uh, you know, I shouldn't just do things good for the right now. Uh, the old saints used to talk about uh, when we pray, we're we're praying, we're sending up timbers. Why are you sending up timbers? When I'm praying, I'm talking to God. I'm investing in my relationship with God. I'm investing in this vertical relationship with God, who teaches me how to live horizontally with people, my family, my friends, my coworkers, with all who teaches me how to do all this thing. That I'm sending, I'm sending up an investment. Uh, to God that uh, that I'm going to be with God for eternity. Uh, that's why Jesus could say to his disciples, look, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you uh, that where I'm that where I am there, you may be also. And so uh, there's a place prepared for the believers already. Uh, we talk about paradise. We talk about heaven. Uh, and, uh, and there are Places in the scripture that give dimensions. The book of Revelation gives dimensions of the holy city, uh, fifteen hundred miles square, I believe, uh, um, fifteen hundred miles left, right, north, south, east, and west. Uh, and some have taken those measurements, and say it's about the size of Pensacola, Florida, and that if you put everybody in America elbow to elbow, everybody could fit in that. Uh, in that uh, in that space, but guess what? Everybody in America ain't going to heaven. Everybody uh, in the world is not going to heaven. Uh, but hell is enlarging herself daily. The scripture tells us. Uh, go read uh, Isaiah chapter five. Hell has enlarged itself. Uh, it's enlarging itself. The devil's got contract general contractors knocking out walls. I got people in my house. Now, uh, knocking out walls to expand or open up uh, the floor plan a little bit for from the laundry room to the old utility room uh, to make it a little more spacious. It's still a small area, but uh, instead of just doing part of it, we decided to go ahead and do all of it. And just seeing the process of, of tearing something out, tearing something down, and then seeing it built back up in different phases. Um, but the hell is 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 knocking out walls, making room for more souls. Why? Because people have lost their way. People are turning away from God rather than turning to God. Uh, and people are blaming God for all the things in the world that are happening bad, happening bad. That's that lets us know that the church is under attack. Godliness is under attack. Uh, even God is, a, if, if the world will attack God, if the world will attack uh, the creator of the world, uh, either verbally or even try to take, we talk about taking God out of the, uh, out of the schools, taking God out of, uh, out of our homes, taking God out of our workplaces, can't say the name of Christ, can't say what you believe uh, uh, on the, in the workplace, you work for a state organization, a federal organization, all these different things. Uh, you know, it, it's getting deeper and deeper as we go forward. And so th we have challenges that we're going to have to face when we put ourselves before the Lord. Uh, and so uh, John told us all those different things, what not to love. Don't love the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These things are not of the Father. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, before, we, before we leave. Romans chapter 12. Verse two, and that's the world. Then we're gonna then we'll deal with the the enemy, uh, 
Satan specifically. We made mention of some things, but we'll, we'll go into a little more detail. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I'm going to read verse 1 too, though. So, uh, so close to the beginning. I, at verse 1 and give it some context. Uh, Romans chapter 12 said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. In other words, I beg you, I plead with you uh, by the mercies of God, present that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse two says, and be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed. And we're, talking, we're still talking about world. We just finished talking about uh, the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these things not being of God, but they are of the world. Here he says, be not conformed unto this world, be not conformed to this world, the ways of this world, but be ye transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the gap, the good, acceptable and perfect gift or perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, Paul tells us. Don't uh, let the world fashion your thinking. Don't world, let worldliness fashion your thinking. Uh, our songwriters and uh, even now, everything now is so legalistic that there are certain things that people are, are afraid to say or if it's going to affect the money, they won't say. I just saw in a Beyonce's uh, new album that she put out. Some people were uh, were uh, giving some uh, lashback or flashback or clashing uh, with uh, some of the words she used in a song. Uh, and so she she changed the word in that song. And then when that happened, some another group came out with something else that uh, I think Monica Lewinsky wanted her to take something out of a song because it mentioned her and the affair she had with Bill Clinton. And so all those different things. So uh, now you can't say anything. Uh, uh, and the artists are saying they're changing their minds because it's going to change their money. But the thing is, we have to be consistent with the word of God and the will of God and not allow worldliness to change our way of thinking. When we make statements uh, that are confirmed by the truth of the word, we should be able to stand, as you hear in the church, stand on the promises of God, standing on the word of God, standing on the principles of God, standing, standing on the living word that we say we trust. We have to trust in the word of the Lord. We'll pick, we have to pick up there next week uh, on that third enemy. There's still some more that we could possibly deal with under the world. So we may we may dig a little bit deeper into this thing about worldliness because it can be confusing. The guy says, uh, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, but then God says uh, to us, uh, don't love the things of the world. Don't love uh, uh, this world. And so we have to be mindful that we are spiritually discerning what God is saying. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. We enjoy every opportunity we have to look into God's word with you. We enjoy studying God's word. We pray you enjoy looking into God's word with us. Uh, and we challenge you uh, to go and study. We challenge you to devote some time uh, in the word. We challenge you to, uh, I challenge you, tell your your family, you love them. Tell your uh, your your spouse. Tell your children. Tell your brothers and sisters. Tell the family that you that you know that you love them. We never know what tomorrow holds. We never know even what the end of this day will hold. And so uh, I admonish you: present your bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God's not going to ask you to do anything unreasonable. But surrender your will to the will of the Father is according to James chapter four, verse seven, uh, because until you submit your will uh, to the will of the Father, submit yourself, therefore, unto God, uh, uh, resist the devil 
and he will flee from you. Uh, draw nigh to God, uh, and he will draw nigh to you. Uh, in that order, submit yourself to God. Then you can resist the devil. Then you draw closer to God, and God draws closer to you. Thank you. We love you. We honor you. We uh, pray for you. Pray for us because there's so much God has for us to do. We need revival in our world. We need revival in our homes. We need revival in our schools. We need revival. Whatever that means, God, change our minds however they need to be changed. Most gracious and heavenly Father, I just want to close in a prayer tonight. Dear God, for all those who are listening and, and sharing with us tonight, dear God, I pray you add blessing over their home. Dear God, give them peace in their spirit. Dear God, with, with so much upheaval going on, so much, uh, so much destruction going on around us, so much death going on around us. Dear God, stabilize us. Dear God, keep us focused on you. Give us perfect peace, dear God, because our minds are stayed on you. We love you. We honor you. And dear God, give us traveling mercies whenever we're traveling. Dear God, dear God, just be with us and help us rest well tonight and have you on our heart and our mind and our spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray and I say amen. God bless you. And I always remember that whatever you need, you can find it in the precious word of God. May God be with you. May God keep you. Amen and amen.